All right, we are. All right, we are live. Good afternoon or good lunchtime on this lovely Wednesday day up here in Humboldt County. I'm uh, Dr. Virgil Moorhead Jr. I'm the Behavioral Health Director here at Two Feathers Native American Family Services. I'm also part of the Big Lagoon Rancheria, which is Yurok and Talawa. And we are on Two Feathers Virtual Indigenous Speaker Series. And we have an outstanding guest today, which I will uh, introduce brief in, uh, in, in after I give uh, uh, the land acknowledgement to the people that uh, Two Feathers is on, which is we're in McKinleyville. California, and we're on the land of the Wiat people. So I wanted to honor uh, the Wiat people during these times, and I also want to pay uh, respect to all those that are that, that are standing in solidarity with our African American brothers and sisters, and that Two Feathers stands in solidarity for the fight for justice and and respect and uh, and uh, those issues that we're. Uh, in the midst of in our society, the American society today. With that, I have uh, the lovely pleasure and honor of uh, introducing our guest, Dr. James Garbarino. Uh, a little bit about Dr. Garbarino is that he is uh, Emeritus Professor of Human Development at Cornell University. In 2018, he was cited by the American Psychological Association as one of the 33 influential psychologists for his work on trauma. In 2016, among many awards, he, he received the Paul Kink Interpersonal Violence Prevention Award. He's the founding director of the Center for the Human Rights of Children at Loyola University in Chicago. And he's an advisor to all sorts of different uh, institutes and in, 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 uh, organizations where policies and uh, systems are set in place, including the National Institute of Mental Health, the National Black Child Development Institute, the FBI, and the U.S. Advisory Board on Child Abuse and Neglect, to name a few. He's also an award-winning author of numerous books, uh, over 10, uh, including, uh, you know, the two more recent books that are on... Uh, understanding uh, people that have committed uh, murders, including one book, Listening to Killers, Lessons from Learned from My 20 Years as a Psychologist Expert Witness in Murder Cases. So with that, welcome Dr. Garbarino. Thank you, I'm glad to be with you. I hope you can all hear well. Um, as you can see, I'm social distancing, so I've got a don't have a very formal shirt on. I hope you won't hold that against me. I'm speaking from home. Uh, I appreciate you beginning with the uh, honoring the place. Uh, I've spoken in uh, many communities around the world, including in New Zealand. And uh, it's always a good sign when people honor the place and the people whose place it is. Um, my wife and I have a strong connection with Guatemala which of all the uh, Latin American countries has the largest indigenous uh, population. And so it's something very close to my heart and I'm very glad to be here uh, with you. Uh, this topic we've chosen protecting the most vulnerable in a socially toxic environment is something that I hope will lead to some questions from people. Um, I wanna start by sort of giving the lay of the land intellectually for that. Um, where I come from intellectually or academically, uh, the way we approach issues of human development is with what is called an ecological perspective. Now, many people use that word in, in various ways, but what I'm trying to convey by that is the understanding that development, human development always occurs in context. And there are very few universals in human development. Almost everything is driven by context as divide, defined by biology, culture, history, social experience. Uh, and the, the net effect of that is something that's very annoying to many people. And that is if you ask the question, does X cause Y? The best scientific answer is almost always, it depends. 
And I said, that's very annoying to people because people crave simplicity, yes or no. You know, when, when I testified in Congress, uh, you can almost hear some of the Congress people saying, oh no, here comes another two-handed psychologist because we're likely to say on the one hand, you have to look at this and then the other hand, you have to look at that. So uh, unfortunately, reality doesn't oblige. Uh, there are, there may be some universals, for example, the work of Ronald Rohner, that's R-O-H-N-E-R, is an anthropologist, uh, looking at the impact of parental rejection, found that across every culture they studied, 118 cultures, the experience of parental rejection is a negative influence on development to the point where he calls it a psychological cancer. Um, and that conveys, I think, to me that the, the real universal is the fact that human beings evolve to crave acceptance, acceptance of who they are and their identity. And so this is why rejection is a universal malignancy because it's, it's depriving of humans something fundamental. But even there, there are contextual factors. The, the proportion of children who experience parental rejection does vary by society to society. I mean, one study, for example, found that the percent of rejection among poor families was lower in Brazil than it was in the United States. And you know, we could we could speculate about why that is. But this fundamental idea of the ecological perspective, does X cause Y, is, is something that has to, I think has to be embedded in the way we think about clinical issues, developmental issues, social policy issues, educational issues, because we're often tempted to, to jump to a simple, this causes that, or there's one answer that, that fits everyone. Let me give you a couple of examples. The first of which I think is sort of cute. A um, number of years ago, a, a developmental psychologist named Eleanor Maccabee, very well-known developmental psychologist asked this question. Does the amount of babbling that an infant does predict how smart that child will become? You know, if you know babies, you know, they babble, blah, 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 blah. If you measured how much they babbled, would it predict their IQ at age five? And the answer was, it depends. It's sort of a trick question. That's always the answer, it depends. What she found was that for girl babies, there was a strong significant correlation between infant babbling and IQ at age five. Uh, infant babbling accounted for about 30% of the variation in IQ at age five. But for boys, the relationship was zero, the correlation was zero. So this is an example of something where it appears gender and maybe as a biological influence, maybe with cultural overtones, means that the pathway to intellectual development may differ. For girls, it seems to go through verbal behavior. For boys, it goes through something else. And this isn't just a quirk of that particular study. Uh, you find it over and over again. People in schools are often interested in uh, bullying. Um, very, you know, it's been a hot topic now for 15, 20 years. Well, people speculated that bullies would be physiologically temperamentally different from non-bullies. It makes sense that bullies would be less, uh, less subject to social influence and more aggressive. So some German researchers studied bullying and they studied, studied the temperament issue. The way they studied it was by looking at the resting heart rate. Now your resting heart rate can be influenced by a number of things, exercise, medications, health issues, but it also reflects temperament. And so they studied the resting heart rate as a measure of temperament in bullies, kids who were victims of bullies and kids who were neither victims nor bullies. But they did it from an ecological perspective, which means they looked at this connection in two different contexts. The contexts they looked at were abusive families and non-abusive families. And it's sort of an aside, if you're developing a research project, if you're a graduate student or for some other reason doing research, one of the most reliable ways to find a significant difference is to compare abusive and non-abusive families. The dynamics are very different. And I'll give another example of that in a minute. But here's what they found. The resting heart rate of bullies in non-abusive families was 65 beats a minute. The resting heart rate of victims who were in non-abusive families was 75 beats a minute. And the resting heart rate of kids who were neither victims nor bullies 
was 70 beats a minute. So the bullies were 65, which suggests a sort of more cold-blooded temperament. The ones at 75, the victims were a more sensitive group and the kids in the middle were in the middle. If you didn't have an ecological perspective, you would draw a conclusion from that. But because it's an ecological perspective, you compare that relationship with what happened in the non-abusive, in the abusive families. So the first was the non-abusive. In the abusive families, the resting heart rate of the bullies was 70 beats a minute. The victims, it was 70 beats a minute. And the kids who were neither victims nor bullies, it was 70 beats a minute. If you only looked at that context, you might conclude temperament has nothing to do with being a bully or a victim. It's only when you have this contrast in context that you see what, what the real questions are. Now, these researchers didn't explain the difference, but what you might think is in the non-abusive families, the temperament of the children is allowed to express themselves. But in the abusive families, the traumatic nature of that context it's strong enough to raise anxiety in the cold-blooded children, raising them from 65 to 70. And the sensitive children can only adapt by dissociating, which brings them down from 75 to 70. So it looks like no difference is really a very important issue. Let me give you a, a, an even better example, maybe more relevant to people who work with kids in crisis. Uh, some of you probably know, and again, I don't know how much people know about some things that they may seem uh, uh, elementary or they may seem advanced, but there's a gene called the MAOA gene, it stands for monoamine oxidase. It's a neurotransmitter, a chemical in your brain, and it's implicated in how you respond to stress or trauma. So to simplify, some kids have this gene turned on, which gives them the normal level of this neurotransmitter. Some have it turned off, which means they approach life in effect with less than others have of this uh, neurotransmitter. So a couple of researchers named Absalom Caspi and Terry Moffat studied the connection between this gene being turned on or turned off and the development of conduct disorder. Now conduct disorder is a clinical diagnosis, but essentially it's just an, a labeling of a chronic pattern of aggression, bad behavior, acting out or violating the rights of others. I mean, that's really all it is. To call it conduct disorder raises the danger that you will think you know more than you know. I just realized we, uh, somebody's come to mow the grass. Tell me if it gets to be too much of a distraction. So let me give you a little elaboration of this issue about conduct disorder. Um, for example, a study in the New York prison system many years ago, this is a study reported in my book, Lost Boys, published in 1999, the study found that 85% of the boys in prison had conduct disorder. Well, that sounds like a research finding until you ask, well, what does that really mean? Because if what it means is 85% of the boys had a chronic pattern of aggression, bad behavior, acting out, or violating the rights of others, well, of course they did. They're in prison. That's how you get there. It's a bit like saying you've done a study of the football team at your high school and 85% of the players are athletes. So it's almost a redundant, uh, self-evident issue. But it is an important thing to know because if kids develop conduct disorder by age 10, they're on the fast track for serious violent delinquency as teenagers. So Caspi asked what percent of kids develop conduct disorder by age 10 in relation to this gene, the MAOA gene. But once again, because they came from an ecological perspective, they looked at it, the context of abusive families and non-abusive families. And what they found was in the abusive families, if you had this gene turned off, which means you had this vulnerability, 85% of the kids develop conduct disorder. If you had the gene turned on and had the normal level and lived in an abusive family, it was only 40%. So the gene doubled the rate of conduct disorder for kids living in abusive families. But in some ways, the more important story for those of us interested in prevention is that in the non-abusive families, the gene was irrelevant. That the rate of conduct disorder was the same and low, whether it was turned on or turned off, if you lived in a non-abusive family. So one of the messages is the more you prevent child abuse, the more you neutralize this vulnerability. And I think that's an important model generally, that there are vulnerabilities which are genetic or environmental or, or personality, biological temperament, but they come into play as a function of the context you're in. One final example of that. 
a lot of people have speculated that psychopaths, who are the most dangerous of human beings, who have no conscience, who have no empathy, that there's a genetic underpinning for that, which is evident in their brains. Well, there's a researcher named James Fallon, who sort of made his career doing the brain scans and identifying psychopaths. You know, he'd look at the brain scan and make a, a diagnosis. Well, one day he was looking at brain scans. He looked at one and said, oh, this is obviously the brain of a psychopath. He turned it over and he found it was his brain scan. So he was faced with this existential crisis. How do I have the brain of a psychopath? And I'm not in prison, I'm a university professor and so on. And he took 10 years to answer the question and wrote a book called The Psychopath Inside, James Fallon. And basically what he came to realize was that he had lived in such a positive supportive context as a child growing up, uh, parents, community, school, cultural identity, racial identity, economic status, that his vulnerability with the psychopath brain was buffered and protected. Now, when he interviewed people about him who knew him, they said, well, you know, you are a bit manipulative, you're a bit emotionally shallow uh, and so on. So he had some of these traits that they've been compensated for by this incredibly powerful pro-social mind. So to me, that's a sort of lead in to, you know, to, to address this topic of protecting the most vulnerable in a socially toxic environment because it speaks to the vulnerability part that uh, the experience of abuse may create vulnerability. The experience of trauma, particularly chronic trauma, particularly chronic trauma in the first three years of life can create enormous vulnerability. Temperament, these biological influences can create vulnerability. But whether that translates into problematic social behavior depends a lot on the context you're in. And that gets us to the second part of the title, a socially toxic environment. Now, what I mean by that is a kind of analogy to the idea of a physically toxic environment. Now, we've come to learn that when there are pollutants and physical toxins in the water, in the air, in the food, uh, this can have a negative effect on development. Uh, some of you may know there is research that found that environmental toxins actually seem to be affecting the level of autism. That secondary autism can be linked to environmental toxins because they break down, uh, they break down the uh, immune system of children and ultimately can actually lead to autism. Um, I think of a couple of examples of this. Um, many years ago, I used to teach at Penn State University, which was in the heart of Amish country. Uh, and the Amish, many people know, are a kind of select group who've tried to distance themselves from modern society. Uh, they typically, they don't use automobiles, they don't have telephones, they don't have computers, they don't even have electricity if they're really strict about it. So they live in a very different social environment. It's very isolated. It's very, um, in a sense, primitive compared to technologically sophisticated 21st century America. Well, there's a, there's a very interesting documentary called Growing Up Amish that was done in the 1970s. So it's now, you know, an old piece. But in the in this uh, documentary, a young Amish man is talking about being an Amish teenager. And he tries to make the point, he says, you know, we were teenagers just like anybody else would be. Sometimes we were kind of wild and crazy. You can see from the interviewer's face, he's wondering what a wild and crazy Amish teenager would be like, you know, because they wear the black costumes and the white shirts and the black hats. And there's, there's none of the, no bling, there's nothing modern about them. So, so the interview says, well, what was a wild and crazy Amish teenager doing in the 1970s? He said, well, we would do wild and crazy things like put white ivory rings on the reins of our buggy or put a colored handkerchief in our white shirt pocket. For them, this was such a wild and daring, crazy activity that they really felt like they were being bad. And then he says, you know, we even had juvenile delinquents. They would do really bad things like ride in an automobile. Now, Riding an automobile was so bad that when you got to be 21 and you wanted to become an adult member of the congregation, you had to confess that you, were, you did bad stuff, you, but you were going straight now. My point is that for most communities, for kids who are testing limits or alienated or angry, what it takes to be wild and crazy or delinquent is so much more dangerous, so much more socially costly than it was for Amish teenagers. 
And I would say in many ways than it was for me as a teenager in the 1960s, than it would be for a teenager in the 2020s. Um, you know, there, was, there was marijuana available, but as many people have known, it was much less powerful than the marijuana available now. Um, in the community I grew up in, there were bad, bad delinquent kids, but there wasn't crack cocaine. There weren't any of the things that make being a, a wild teenager so dangerous. And so the idea of social toxicity is that the cultural and social context in which kids are growing up has an impact on, among other things, how dangerous their behavior will be if they are vulnerable and, and troubled. You know, as you mentioned, I do a lot of work with people who have committed murder. My most recent book is called Miller's Children about adolescents who commit murder and how their rehabilitation can go forward. And I'm constantly struck listening to their stories that if they had grown up with the same temperament, some of the same experiences in my community in the 1950s and 60s, they would not be sitting across from me in prison facing life in prison for murder. But context is so very important. And here's an example of that. I mentioned conduct disorder before. The, the figure is that if you have conduct disorder by the time you're 10, about 30% of those kids will end up as serious violent delinquents. But that's in general. But nobody lives in general. It turns out in some neighborhoods, that figure is not 30%, but 60% of the 10-year-olds with conduct disorder will end up as serious violent delinquents. In other neighborhoods, it's not 30%, but 15%. So the neighborhood you're in can affect by a factor of four whether your 10-year-old conduct disorder translates into serious violent delinquency. So context here is very important. And this idea of social toxicity is a way of evaluating the context. Does it offer affirmation and acceptance? Does it offer validation for identity? Now, some of the most important toxic issues uh, that I think are relevant you know, to any American youth, but particularly probably for indigenous or native youth, one of them, of course, is the role of racism in development. Uh, the role of slavery and genocide in historical context. And there are many reasons for that, some of them structural, some of them psychological. Many years ago, I was on the dissertation committee of a student in, in anthropology who was studying the Iroquois, the native people in New York State where I am now. And what his issue was the theme of loss in Iroquois culture. You know, and then many of you probably know the book of 1491 which deals with the Americas before the European contact and invasion. And as if you've read that book, you know that the mortality rate for indigenous people in the Americas was something on the order of 90%. And so when you think about, for example, if you're familiar with the, the impact of the Holocaust on Jewish people in Europe, where the, the fatality rate was something like 50%, imagine 90% fatality. And that's what this guy was studying, how the theme of loss had been incorporated in Iroquois culture because it, it was a fundamental loss that it stretched over hundreds of years. Now, and that loss can translate into individual psychological issues because psychology always takes place within a cultural context. Uh, so, you know, the original sins of American society, genocide and slavery, reverberate in identity issues. Um, you know, as many people know, some of, some of us have the joint issues of native identity or Indian identity and black or African-American identity. So I, the figure I recall was something like 35% of people identifying as African-Americans have native heritage. I remember an individual kid I worked with, he was about 15. Uh, he was detained in a juvenile facility. Um, he, he was obviously part native part Indian, part indigenous, whichever the best term is. And this has been a source of bullying and harassment in his life as a black kid, but also a source of confusion in his identity. And when we presented him with a book that some of you may know, a book called The Black Americans, um, uh, it, it transformed his whole uh, uh, social functioning and identity because once he understood that being a black Indian was not some aberration, but was a historical cultural phenomenon. It gave him a place, positive place to stand culturally, which allowed them then to encounter the world in a much more uh, positive, uh, confident way. Because 
he now had a positive definition, a positive rendering of his identity, which he could bring to bear as opposed to sort of drowning in this, uh, this negative consciousness that he had had. So that is one crucial element of social toxicity. Another one that's particularly strong in America is economic inequality. You know, this has been studied many ways for many years. Um, you know, there was a study called the Luxembourg Income Study, which asked how much richer is the top 10% of the economy as opposed to bottom 10%. And there are countries where that figure was only two to one. The rich were two times as rich as the very poor. Uh, Canada, it was four to one. The United States was the only one of the major countries studied that had a ratio of six to one. And that was 20 years ago, it's probably gotten worse. There's a measure called the Gini index, G-I-N-I. -I. It measures the degree to which there's income inequality. So for example, a Gini score of 100 would mean that 1% of the population had all of the wealth. A score of zero would mean that there was completely equal distribution of income across the society. Well, no country has a zero or 100, but some Scandinavian countries have scores of 20 something. Uh, there are countries that have scores of 80 something. The United States score is about 40, which is as bad as some places that we think of as being very unequal. And this issue of economic inequality from a psychological perspective is probably more important than the issue of poverty itself because it's this relative deprivation. A kid once said to me in an interview, he said, Dr. Garbarino, did you grow up poor or regular? And I thought that was a very powerful, incisive comment because if that's the choice, poor or regular, then to be poor means irregular. And the connotations for negative self-worth and, and, and feelings of rejection are just, are just very, very powerful and overwhelming. So, you know, briefly, and obviously I could talk about this for many, many years, I have, but, but in a nutshell, that's how I would unpack this title, protecting the most vulnerable in the socially toxic environment. Of course, and then we could move on to the question of protecting, which has to do with preventing child abuse and dealing with rejection issues and dealing with positive identity and consciousness issues. I mean, consciousness is so transcendently important I mean, I see that in the guys I work with who committed murders at 17, and now they're 37, and they've undergone this transformation of consciousness, which was completely unexpected by the people when they were 17, because people wrote them off at that point and didn't see their potential for rehabilitation and positive transformation. And a lot of times what they've done is through education, through spiritual development, through cultural consciousness and awareness, uh, and through practicing techniques of meditation and, and self-discipline, all of which give them a positive way to resolve the trauma that they dealt with. So let me at least pause at that point and see if there are questions that you have, because obviously I can just go back to talking. Yeah, I think, thank you for that. And I, the question that I have, or just to narrow in on some of uh, what you said is to, to sort of pick uh, trauma and uh, in understanding trauma. And, and one of the things that in, in reading some of your work that you talk about, which I thought is really important, is uh, around sort of uh, the like desensitizing, sensitizing, uh, and really understanding how uh, you, you can heal from trauma. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, and so I'm wondering, and even on the, the, the talking about hardiness and through the positive psychology framework. Yeah. And so I just wanted if you can uh, talk a little bit more about as you see it, uh, because a lot of the, the, the individuals that you've uh, interviewed and set across uh, uh, the ones that have committed murder, what you lay out in your, your, your two more recent books is how much developmental complex trauma they've experienced and neglect that they've experienced in their life. And so, you know, just the, the human capacity to heal from that kind of stuff and what you've seen as uh, helpful in, in that, in a sense, restor rest restoration of the soul, I guess you would call yeah. it. Well, thank you. That, that's helpful. Um, you know, trauma is obviously a term that's become very widespread in its use. You know, within my professional lifetime, it went from being a sort of arcane, 
narrow, you know, specialized focus to something we see as a general explanatory concept. So many things make sense if you view them through this perspective of trauma. What is it? You know, there are sort of evocative definitions. One of my favorite comes from Susan Segroy, is it S-G-R-O-I, who said trauma is coming face to face with human vulnerability in the natural world or with the capacity for evil in human nature. So this embraces why hurricanes and tornadoes can be traumatic, but also why being abused and, and attacked and hurt can be traumatic. That it's, it's a simultaneous experience of overwhelming arousal, the sensory experience of sort of having your circuits blown, of being just, you're, you're obliterated with fear and terror, coupled with the idea of what is happening destabilizes you completely. You know, that, uh, that the earth could move to the point where a building disappears, that idea coupled with the sensation of it, or that you could walk out your door and somebody could be there with a knife and assault you and rape you, or that your parent could beat you to the point where you are bloody and suffering. So uh, the, it's been important to understand how common trauma is, but it's also been important to understand that a single incident of trauma, it's often called acute trauma. The, actually, the prognosis for recovery is generally very good. Uh, the study, for example, of kids who were close to the World Trade Center in New York City on 9-11, you know, come back a year later and they're 85% basically doing as well as they were before. And that's very commonly observed because if you only have a single incident of trauma, you can rally your resources. You're likely to get the therapy of reassurance, which is life goes back to normal, and you're persuaded of that because it is back to normal. You may even get some short-term psychological first aid, particularly nowadays. It wasn't always that way, but now you are likely to get that. And most people, unless they have some pre-existing vulnerability, can rally to recover from a single incident of trauma. But it's when you get to multiple or chronic trauma that you start to get the bigger challenge because you can't simply have a therapy of reassurance. You can't say it's okay, things are back to normal because normal is the problem. It happened before, it'll happen again. This is one reason why to build on your, your question, you know, we have this term PTSD that probably now everybody seems to know that term, post-traumatic stress disorder. I really think it's important that we change what the D stands for. It's really important that we think about it in terms of post-traumatic stress development, because that's really the issue. How do you develop going forward from trauma? So it's not just a matter of you're traumatized, you're done. Because with one incident of trauma, most people, 85% within a year, will have developed back to where they were. If you have multiple incidents of trauma, many people can recover and do recover. So the focus needs to be on what does it take to have post-traumatic stress development? Now, there is a special category within trauma that uh, people need to be aware of. Um, it's people who are severely traumatized on a chronic basis over the first three years of life. Um, that, you know, the, the research on this, for example, research by Kathleen Heidi, H-E-I-D-E, -E, you know, finds that if you're in that category, the, it's an incredibly uphill battle to undertake post-traumatic stress development because Severe chronic trauma in the first three years of life is a sort of frontal assault on the basic process of becoming a human being. And what it takes to overcome that is just enormous. And uh, you know, the range of consequences run from um, possibly psychopathic behavior to uh, emotional numbing, to denial, depression, almost every possible negative diagnosis you could get and I once worked on a case of a 33-year-old man who had been a victim of this you know, severe chronic trauma in the first three years of life. He in his file had 11 different diagnoses, but nobody said chronic trauma in the first three years of life. That was his problem. But he had all of these compensatory problems that came along with it. And, and people, because they were narrowly focused clinically, didn't see the underlying issue. Uh, but with, that, with the exception perhaps of that category, it is possible uh, to, to build resilience to cope with trauma and actually experience post-traumatic stress development. And that of course leads us into this whole domain of what are the foundations for resilience. 
there are many attempts to do that. One of my favorites was produced by a, a German American psychologist named Emmy. Uh, in Germany, it would be Werner. Americans often call her Werner because it's W. But she, based on decades of research, said there were a number of pillars of resilience. And I see this often in the guys up in prison who've undertaken post traumatic uh, development um, and come out of it 20 years later. One of them is at least average intellectual functioning. And it's, a, it's an unfortunate but sad truth that if you have at least average intellectual functioning, it's like having two hands free, <clears throat> that you can, uh, you're better equipped to deal with things. Being significantly disabled intellectually is like having one hand tied behind your back. And that emerges in the resilience research. The second thing is having at least one person who has unconditional love for you, <clears throat> who's crazy about you. It gives you a place to stand in the universe. And this is always something I'm always looking for. Is there somebody? All right, your mother abandoned you, your father rejected you. Is there somebody? Is there a grandmother? Is there somebody who you can who connected with you and gave you a sense of validation and worth? Another thing that's interesting emerges is what is called androgyny, which is the combining in one person of traditionally feminine and traditionally masculine attributes. And again, I'll use that hands free. If you have both a masculine hand and a traditional feminine hand to bring to bear, you're more adaptable, more resilient than if you're narrowly sex typed, male or female. Uh, I think that makes a lot of sense to people. That's been found across cultures uh, along with the acceptance rejection continuum. There are other things, an educational system that is democratic and promotes a positive identity. Uh, having a special talent or ability um, you know, this is a very interesting one because when schools cut back budgets, they often view things like the music program, the art program as being frills, when in fact for vulnerable kids, they may be essential elements because it is precisely that talent that they have, whether it's uh, singing, writing, drawing, painting, or jumping, running, whatever it is, that gives them some positive access to the world and turns out to be one of the pillars uh, for resilience. Another one that's sort of unfair is having a personality or an appearance that invites people uh, into your life, that leads people to seek you out for positive treatment. I remember when I read that, I thought about all the refugee camps I'd been to when I used to do a lot of international work on children in war zones. And you go to a refugee camp, there's always one or two kids that you think, boy, I wish I could take that kid with me. And it's because they have some personal appealing quality that, you know, that brings people to them, that draws people to do them. So if you look at all this work on resilience, I think it gives us an agenda for thinking about protecting the most vulnerable uh, in a socially toxic environment because it says that post-traumatic stress development is possible and it's just a matter of amassing the resources internally and externally uh, to promote it. And when you mentioned before when the American Psychological Association listed me as one of 33 influential psychologists, they asked us to write, I think it was a 500 word piece on what we thought was the most important contribution and thing for the future. And what I wrote about was this idea of post-traumatic stress development. Thank you. And, and to sort of add to that and, and, and bringing it into today's times, uh, you know, in your book on the positive psychology, you, you sort of juxtapose or, or, you know, put yourself in the, growing up in the 1950s and then today's times, uh, which was, I think, you know, 10 years ago with that book. But uh, with, with today's times around uh, uh, the video games and violence on TV, and, you know, I think part of, of your work it, sh through an ecological framework is that it's the accumulation of risk. So you have uh, youth that have been through uh, a violent childhood uh, in the sense of family. You, you maybe they're in the war zone, which is like community violence. And then their temperament uh, is uh, also contributing to, to you know, these factors that, that disrupt their uh, development. And one of those being uh, our society. And so, I, uh, so our, our culture in today's society in the sense of like social media, in the sense of uh, violent video games. And so I'm, I, I'm curious about how that plays into your understanding of trauma, your understanding of development 
and and your your sort of recommendations for those parents and teachers working with with youth in today's times? Well, I think you know, like a lot of things, it presents a mixed picture. Uh, with respect to the socially toxic nature of the, of the society. Uh, some things are better. Um, some, uh, particularly a lot of the identity issues are better than they were. You know, when I was a kid, if you were a gay kid, you were at best ostracized. You probably were closeted. You probably had issues of self-worth based on your sexual orientation. Um, you know, I mean, I, I knew somebody in college who it wasn't until years later I found out he was gay, he committed suicide. Today, that would not be a big issue in many places, in most places. Uh, by the same token, the 50s, you know, were a great place if you were a white, straight kid living in a two-parent family. But if you were a gay kid or lesbian kid, if you were black or Hispanic or native, you know, those were tough times because there was such a narrow range of positive identities that were promoted. So I think there has been progress in those issues, but as I think you allude to, there's also the accumulation of risk factors which are threatening. You know, the research on TV violence shows that TV violence is about as powerful in predicting physical aggression uh, as smoking is in producing cancer, lung cancer. It's a real thing. Uh, video games, violent video games, and research shows that the most effective way, excuse me, to break down an inhibition against killing is a point and shoot violent video game because it trains you to break down the inhibition about actually killing someone. Um, so these kinds of influences, the, the shallow materialism that is so powerfully promoted is another factor. You know, there's a study back from, I don't know, the 50s, 60s. They asked kids, what do you want to be when you grow up? And most of the answers were jobs. They were things like being a fireman, be a policeman, be a doctor, be a nurse, whatever it is. When that study was repeated a few years ago, the most common answers were rich. Not that they wanted to be something, but to have, you know, to, to be rich or to be famous. So I think that's a cultural threat. And I once worked on a case where a 19 year old was given a life sentence. And his first words were, I'm gonna kill myself. And I said, why? And he said, because I'm never going to the mall again. And you think if, you know, the culture does push that, that your value and your status depends upon your accumulation of material success. And that's antithetical to our deepest values, certainly. There's a lot more again. Uh, but it also, you know, it's one thing if you're an affluent kid, you can indulge that. But if you're a poor kid, that impulse amid shallow materialism becomes so dangerous and destructive for you because you can't compete or to compete, you have to do things which put you at further risk. So I think those really are uh, threats. You know, the, the, the food environment is a part of this risk environment. That's been brought out by the COVID-19 virus that it's that so many Americans are so unhealthy in their eating habits and their exercise habits that they become vulnerable to, to the virus. They be, there are so many people are immune compromised because of lifestyle issues. And the video games and the TV, you know, and the fast food all provide a kind of conspiracy against well-being in people, which again, most negatively affect those who already have other risk factors. So I think you're right, as always, it's the accumulation of risk factors. You know, somebody once asked me about school shooters, what causes a kid to become a school shooter? You know, what I said was, it's like building a tower of blocks. You put block after block after block, and finally you put one more block on the tower and it falls over. You don't really want to say that block is the cause. It's only because that came after the other accumulation. That makes sense. And, and one of the things that I've mentioned, and this kind of speaks to uh, uh, a question that we got from the audience, is that, that, that you've said to, to live in fear and falsehood is worse than death. And one of the questions from one of our audience uh, on Facebook uh, is uh, Trilby. And she says, do you think being denied factual education can be traumatic to K through 12 schools? And so I think maybe this can tie into a larger uh, narrative around what's going on in our society, whether it's with our president or just with the news. And, and around you know false news and, 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 
And so I'm, I'm wondering your thoughts about that. Do you think being denied factual education can be traumatic to K through 12 schools and then maybe unpack the, uh, the statement that the, the quote that you use is uh, to live in fear and falsehood is worse than death. Well, I think, um, as I said, when I started, the answer is, the first answer is always, it depends. <laughs> I know that's irritating, but there's a lot of truth to that. I think that, you know, when I look back to the experience of children in the 50s compared with now, now that's a long time ago, but in some ways it does provide a useful comparison. Uh, one of the things that, that differentiates these two eras was that there was a sense of authoritative information uh, that allowed a much more common, common ground for public discussion. Um, you know, again, I don't know how many of you viewers are old enough to remember when you know, there were three television networks, that was it, ABC, NBC, and CBS. And, and so there was a common experience of, of news. Now, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who was a senator from New York, said uh, back in the 60s, he said, you're entitled to your own opinion but you're not entitled to your own facts. And looking back, that now seems like very naive because now that's precisely the thing people claim is they have a right to their facts. And there is, there's been an erosion of the sense of common factuality, if you will. I don't know if that's what the question is talking about, about factual education. But, but I, think, I think that really is a problem because it's very hard to have any kind of unity when you don't have a common definition of reality. And I think something like Fox News, for example, does a terrible disservice to America because it promotes a false reality about life, about who people are, about what happens. And as a result, you know, if you, if, and there is a stu recent study that found that Fox viewers say they get almost all of their news from Fox News, whereas people who don't watch Fox News have multiple sources and they get a much more balanced, complete picture of the world. So if you watch Fox News, there are things that you think make sense only because you've been given a distorted view. And it makes it almost impossible to have genuine public discussion. And you know, at the risk of offending people, and I, this group probably isn't offended, but you know, President Trump is the worst example of this in our history, probably, certainly in our modern history, because he lies so consistently, he distorts the truth, he seeks out personal gain over national goals. Uh, if he were writing a scenario for the worst possible president, you know, he would fit the bill. But if you're a Fox News viewer, you think he's the best president ever. And, and that gap is such an impediment for any progress moving, moving forward. Now the current, the current cup, uh, uprising against you know, police brutality uh, seems to have cut through some of that because there are visual presentations. You know, uh, it's pretty hard to look at uh, a guy being murdered, you know, with somebody's neck on uh, knee on his neck, and give a spin to that. But you know, just uh, yesterday, the president gave a spin to that 75-year-old white man in Buffalo who was knocked down by the police. And, and so, even something that looks visually as simple as, if you watch it, he approaches the police, they push him down, he falls back and hits his head and bleeds. There are people spinning that into being a a conspiracy against President Trump. So factual education, I think, um, is a crucial element in building any kind of society or community and getting the truth out about immigrants, about native people, about black people uh, is, is essential to having a realistic view of America and not this distorted biased view that, that certainly has dominated historically and is now you know, really coming into into challenge and relief, and that is a source of good news. Um, you know, when, when I was in uh, when I was in high school, they, we used to. Uh, it was after school; uh, we weren't allowed to have public prayer in school, and so schools would have what they called inspirational readings. Well, as a student leader, I eventually got my turn to do the inspirational reading, and this is right in the mid '60s, at the time of Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement, and I read to the school assembly a passage from On Civil Disobedience by Henry David Thoreau. Well, it was the last time they let a, let a student choose the reading because it was so inflammatory that he was a student you know, in a white school promoting Martin Luther King 
and, and black civil rights. But now, you know, that would not be such a stretch anymore. And I think what's happening recently is such good news in that respect. How we, you know, how it turns out in November is another issue, but, but I'm very encouraged by the fact that there is much more factual dealing with ethnic and cultural diversity uh, than there has been, you know, in our history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And so I see, uh, you know, we're winding down on time and to see if I could get in uh, two questions uh, that are kind of taking a, a, a steer away from what we've been talking about. And those two themes or questions are around spirituality and sort of existential issues uh, in your own work and how you see transformational change at the community individual level. And the second, uh, in part to the uh, related to that first question is around your love and appreciation of dogs. And, uh, you know, the the wisdom and the, the tremendous benefit that you see from relationships with dogs. And so if you wanted to tackle one or both of those, that would be great. Well, I see what I can do. I mean, I've been struck uh, that one of the foundations for rehabilitation in these guys in prison is spiritual development. And I would say that, you know, one of the most common risk factors for the worst behavior is spiritual emptiness, that you see the world purely in material terms. Whereas if you have a spiritual orientation, you have a place to stand in the universe. Otherwise, you're alone in the universe and you're nothing more than a, a bunch of, you know, uh, bones and blood and, and that's not very inspiring. So feeling part of a larger universe is very important. And I know that's one reason why in native communities, one of the resources that people have tried to build on is native spirituality as a resource for resilience and identity. Uh, and that's true, you know, I see a lot of guys in prison who find a spiritual path, which gives them a sense of hope, a sense of possible redemption, gives them a sense of meaningfulness, as opposed to living in a, an empty world. Uh, for me, dogs are an important part of that because dogs live in the present moment. Um, having a sort of ethic of compassion across species is one way to generate more compassion towards human beings. And having a respect for all forms of life is I think an incalculably valuable resource for individuals and for communities, particularly when deal you're dealing with trauma. Um, you know, there are, there are programs in prison of training dogs, which turn out to be incredibly healing and educative for their inmates, in addition to the dogs. Um, this idea that you develop an ethic of caring and a circle of caring, and that you make it as big as you can, caring for another being uh, is a way to broaden your circle of caring. And dogs are perfect for that because they operate at such an advanced emotional level that you, even if you're sort of stunted emotionally with people, you can find a pathway through dogs to that. This has been found with autistic children. You know, tethering autistic children to dogs has proved to be a very valuable therapeutic intervention. And it's true for all of us. Now, you know, I deal with, as you point out, so much trauma vicariously by sitting down with all these murderers that one of my links to sanity you know, is the dog. Who's like, she's sitting right here right now. But you know, caring for her, hugging her, being with her is, is very protective for me when I have to venture into the darkness that is so much a part of my professional life. So uh, uh, I'm a confirmed spirituality person. And for me, dogs and spirituality go paw and paw. Thank you. And I see uh, we're at the top of the hour. Uh, I'm seeing uh, if there's any you know, I think that, uh, you know, just want to throw it back at you as we finish, if there's uh, any last words, uh, recommendations, thoughts that you have. Uh, you know, I just want to add that, you know, in reading your your work that, that you know, I, I really appreciate the authenticity and the, the, the integrity and the, the honesty that comes across and the, and the work that, that you've been doing for those that are often pushed out of our society and, and, and given up on because 
I think that's a big part of the work that we're doing here, trying to do at Two Feathers is to, to have that compassion and, and that forgiveness uh, and to keep showing up for those that are, are seen as uh, not repairable. Uh, and so I want to say, say, give you uh, appreciation for that and just, you know, throw anything out to you if you want any last words or. Well, thank you. I, you know, I appreciate that validation. Um, you know, I'm 73 years old and uh, what keeps me going is this mission of expanding my circle of caring. And I'm so inspired sometimes by what I've seen people come out of and become and you know there's a very famous study called project talent they went to people who i think maybe were 40 and they asked them what was the best or most important thing from high school and many many people named a particular teacher and in some cases they go back to that teacher and you know say do you remember you know john smith no idea the point is that as an adult working with youth, you may be having a profound influence. It may take a while for it to show up because they have to recalibrate themselves and process things and move through. But you can be an incredibly powerful source simply by being present, by offering acceptance rather than rejection and offering hope to people who often feel uh, buried in the darkness and despair. And, and so I, you know, I, I applaud what you, what you people are doing in your program. And uh, I'm really honored to, you know, for an hour to, to be part of it. Thank you. And, uh, and thank you all for tuning in. Uh, I was able to look at a lot of the comments and questions. We got to a couple of them uh, and uh, we'll follow up. Uh, and I wanna thank uh, Dr. Gabarino for his time uh, during these challenging times. And, uh, and I want to let everybody know that we'll be back at it tomorrow with a panel on, a very exciting panel on uh, the flower dance ceremony, which is a local woman's coming of age ceremony in our area. And we have a panel of well-esteemed, well-respected uh, cultural and traditional leaders in our area. And that will be tomorrow at 12 o'clock. So tune in and uh, thank you again. Uh, and we are going off now.